Meanwhile, work had begun on the four nuclear trenches. These were the widest and deepest trenches and did not use the undercutting principle. On this cut, we used three plows simultaneously, two plows throwing up snow from below, the third cutting a spoil trench up above to prevent loose snow from sliding back into the cut. To avoid melting caused by the sun, much of this work was done at night. These scenes were filmed at 2 a.m. The continuous sunlight caused us plenty of headaches. A black tarpaulin was used to protect the section of this 40-foot cut most vulnerable to the sun's rays. Below, foundations and structure for the reactor building were put in place. Until the trench was covered, there was always a threat that the 40-foot arches would collapse a shoulder already weakened by the 24-hour-a-day Arctic sunlight. The faster the roof went up, the better. The frame for the reactor building was made of steel beams. Despite the cold and the constant winds, my construction workers climbed like monkeys over the scaffolding and rode the beams into place. At this same time, within the tunnels already completed, we were installing piping for water and electricity. Heavy insulation material was wrapped around every pipe to protect against the extreme cold. A copper heating element inside the insulation kept water lines from freezing. Flexible sewage lines also had to be run through the camp. At this time, to keep on schedule, we were using 12 and sometimes 14-hour shifts. For like any modern city, Camp Century required a complex of interconnecting corridors carrying a maze of piping of all sizes and shapes. One of our proudest achievements was our solution of the water problem. A steam hose with a special drilling nozzle was used to melt a hole three and a half feet in diameter, 120 feet down into the ice cap, until a pool of water formed, which did not drain off. This pool provided 10,000 gallons of fresh water daily. Throughout the camp, an extensive electrical system was now installed. For electrical heating would not only be clean, but it would also reduce the threat of fire. And fire was the worst hazard under the ice. The Marine Fiddler arrived at Thule with the nuclear power plant. Designed for air transportability, but transported by sea to reduce costs, the nuclear plant was the last major phase of our operation and the most difficult. This unit, for example, part of a vapor container, weighed more than 21 tons. Awkward to handle and with high centers of gravity, these packages were delivered to the ice cap over a road built specifically for their transport. More than 400 tons of piping and machinery arrived in this one shipment. Since the Arctic cold makes metal very brittle, each unit had to be handled with great care. Even a routine impact could cause metal to crack or break. Both Colonel Kirkering and the swing commander checked the loading. The vapor container, the largest single item in the power plant, was carried on a special flat bottom sled built expressly for its transport. Everything seemed fine the morning the heavy swing moved out. But 
unfortunately, it was only a few hours later that one of the worst storms of the season blew up. To complete preparations to receive the nuclear plant, my crews bundled up and kept on working. The opening in the roof of the main nuclear trench now had to be closed quickly before the trench began filling with snow. Despite the storm, the heavy swing was still moving. At our end, my crews kept working. It was the only way we could be ready. Out on the ice, the storm cleared a little, and notwithstanding the tremendous load and the weather, this swing made the trip in record time. Just as the swing arrived at the camp, the storm let up entirely. Work began immediately unloading the shipment in preparation for its emplacement. Covers were removed, crates opened. None of the excitement affected Mukluk in the least. Boxes of piping and wiring, each item carefully labeled, were opened so that each unit would be available when needed. Major components shipped in pieces because of weight limitations were reassembled before being moved into the trenches. The condenser, 15 tons of steel, was one of the first units to be moved into the tunnel prepared to house it. When the condenser was slowly winched forward, small track rollers supported its entire weight. Next, still mounted on its special sled, the vapor container was eased down the ramp by three tractors, one in front pulling and two in back to keep it from slipping. To bear the weight of the vapor container, the reactor building was constructed around a framework of steel beams. The floor was of heavy planking mounted on other steel beams. We had to use hand rigging methods, the best we could do under the confined conditions, to put the nuclear equipment in place. Every step had to be checked very carefully since the power plant had been pre-fitted in the United States and must be emplaced within a tolerance of one eighth of an inch. The power plant consisted of four basic elements a nuclear heat source, equipment that would convert the heat energy into electrical energy, and a system to dispose of excess heat, all regulated by an extensive network of instruments and controls. The last buildings to be assembled were those that would contain the nuclear sections. These shells were built around the nuclear system equipment only after every major component had been put in place. The next phase was to be the activation of the nuclear power plant. Wearing the white safety hat is Captain Jim Barnett, in charge of this operation, who will tell you about this critical phase. We took every precaution in the book, and some that weren't there, to make sure this would work right the first time. When the entire system had been carefully tested, it was put into operation. We were then ready to begin loading the reactor core. One by one, the fuel elements were removed from the barrels in which they'd been shipped, carefully separated from one another. Each of these bars, containing approximately 500 grams of uranium-235, was then unwrapped, inspected, and wiped clean of any dust. Crewmen wearing protective clothing began to load the fuel elements into a fuel storage tank. This preliminary test proved that the fuel elements, when assembled, would not go active prematurely. After each element was in place, instruments were read and an evaluation of reactivity was made and reported over loudspeakers. The crewmen were protected by a shield of approximately eight feet of water as they lowered the fuel elements into the fuel storage tank. Later, each of these steel and uranium bars would be transferred underwater to the nearby reactor core. Every step of the testing was meticulously monitored 
and regular announcements made to the workers assigned to the loading crew. Total U-235 content of the assembled core is 13.376 kilograms. Coefficient of reactivity 0.935. The assembly is still subcritical. When all preliminary tests were completed, we began to transfer the fuel elements one by one and started loading the reactor core. As each fuel element went into place, the count rate of neutrons released gradually increased. Within the core, to prevent the reactor from inadvertently going critical, control rods were in place. This gradual activation of the pile took almost nine hours. In this tense atmosphere, we changed crews twice. Above us, it was dark and miserable. With the approach of winter, the sun was preparing to set for the year. Finally, our meters reported a significant increase of reactivity. The whole camp was standing by, waiting, tense. By the ninth hour, the last fuel element had gone into place. A plot showed the location of every bar. Then the control rods were gradually withdrawn until the reactor went critical at 6.52 a.m. Now here it is. With all five control rods withdrawn 6.24 inches, PM 2A went critical at 0.652 hours. Within the next few weeks, the final touches were put to Camp Century. Today, powered by its nuclear reactor, this unique installation is a completely modern community, deep under the ice. This is a far cry from the primitive Jamesway huts of the work camp, where three showers served 250 men. Here, there are showers for all, and facilities for every modern convenience. Among the many sophisticated facilities at Camp Century is the dispensary, complete in every detail. For while the remote research community is isolated by 150 miles of ice and snow, its medical capabilities can cope with almost any emergency. It also has a small chapel for regular religious services. And it boasts the largest deep freeze in the world. Here is enough food to feed the camp for several months. Everything from steak to fruit salad. The modern spacious kitchens provide a well-balanced and appetizing menu. To satisfy the enormous appetites that working in this climate produces means extra rations, but there's always more than enough. Except for the fact that they have no windows, the men of Camp Century live exactly as do other soldiers. Their quarters are modern, spacious, comfortable, and are not lacking in any detail. Throughout the long period of construction within the primitive facilities of the work camp, the men solved the everyday problems of working and living as best they could. Twenty-five thousand gallons of diesel fuel. 
110 tons, an all-time record sled load. 